Santa América, Televisión Dominicana para el Mundo. Sometimes life can be so damn hard. You don't know where to go. Everything keeps falling apart. Yeah. You try to do your best, but only God knows that you've given everything you've got, but the world takes you down. You just keep moving on. Let your fears. Welcome to A Time for Truth. I'm your host, Dr. Bernard Fialkoff. And in today's show, we're going to address the subject of personal integrity and duty. In our world, we're technologically very advanced. But corruption seems to increase day by day. And people are looking, we're all looking, so how do we reinstill those qualities of human decency, care for our fellow human being, and care and interest in the community to make it safe for all of us to live together in this greatest city of the world, New York City. Today, we're very honored to have a very special guest with a lifelong legacy, really, of uh, unbelievable dedication to New York City. And uh, Buddha, if you can put him up on the screen for the viewers, I want to give a little bio of our guest today, Mr. Curtis Sliwa, who was born in Canarsie, Brooklyn. And uh, as a youth at Canarsie High School, he worked delivery of the New York Daily News and it's amazing he was awarded the Newsboy of the Year and a trip to the White House after he saved several people from a burning building while doing his paper route really the beginning of what he would do in his whole life in the late 1970s New York City was a modern day equivalent of the Wild West murder and violent crime in the streets the subways and as a former Jesuit student, Sliwa felt he had to do something. And the new, he knew that his city that he loved needed and deserved better. So he formed a group of 13 dedicated volunteers amongst himself also and started riding the subways and patrolling the streets of New York, serving as protectors of everyday law-abiding citizens. And this was the birth of his group the Red Beret Guardian Angels, operating under the motto, We Dare to Care. The Guardian Angels now have chapters in 13 countries, over 100 cities, and a membership of thousands across the globe. Their mission is to make a positive change in the community by involving members of the community to step forward and take an active role. While the classic street patrols of his group were the lifeblood of the organization, he also founded the Junior Angels Program, the Youth Outreach Programs, and the Washington Heights Community Center to help kids with every, everything from homework to nutrition while getting them actively involved in their communities. Mr. Sliwa authored Street Smart, The Guardian Angel Guide to Safe Living, and he believes that when people take an active role in the community, it makes things better for all of us, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Amazingly, I don't know how he had the time, but Curtis Lewa was also a prominent radio broadcaster since 1990, spending three decades on WABC, WNYC, and as a populist conservative radio host. He founded the Curtis Lewa Life Program in 2008 and continued until recently when he officially declared his candidacy for New York City Mayor. And it's our honor, Buddha, if you put him on the screen, to welcome Mr. Curtis Lewa to A Time for Truth.
How are you doing? No, busy, busy. In fact, just came out of the subways where I was campaigning, where I do a lot of my campaigning. That's like a natural focus group. You don't need to pay anybody. You don't need consultants. It's me and the subway riders, and they tell me all the problems they have. And then they expect me to give my answers as to how as mayor I would fix it. So it's a perfect opportunity to engage people. I can totally see that very real, very real situation. I was going to ask you something because as I was reading your bio, uh, I really, you know, I would call you a modern day but real life Rambo. And, you know, since you were a young kid, so uh, or Bruce Willis in the movies that he's done saving people. So what I want to ask you is what drove you to start protecting and saving people from such an early age? Well, you know, I trace everything to the influence of my mom and dad. Uh, Chester, Polish-American, my mother, Francesca, Italian-American. They met right before World War II. Like a lot of couples got married before he had to ship out. And uh, they always, by their deeds, showed me that you needed to do good things for other people and never ask anything in return. Never ask where, when, why, how you may finally get something good happening in your life. But they assured me. They said, Curtis, if you do good things, you'll get good things in return. And they were absolutely right. And the other key guiding factor that's helped me, and not just coming to the need of the poor, the indigent, those who live in crime-ravaged neighborhoods, is also the many homeless and emotionally disturbed persons that we run across these lost souls that society has given up on. And my father, at an early age, uh, took me to the Bowery, where the missions and the flop houses were uh, in lower Manhattan. Now, you couldn't even afford a reverse mortgage on the co-ops of the condos there now. But back then, it was New York City Skid Row, well, mostly men, some women. And he would tell me, there, by the grace of God, go you, Curtis. I never want to hear that you made fun of them, laughed about them. Uh, pointing fingers at them in any given day on any given hour you yourself might end up in their position your your responsibility like everyone's responsibility to see how we can help them so that really stuck with me because clearly i have seen a lot of my peers in growing up make fun of these men or women you know call them crazy out of their mind they need to be put away in insane asylums and all the worst derogatory things you can say about people who clearly are lost souls. And I know we have the medical health programs to care for them, the medicine that can normalize them, and yet we cut them loose into the streets, the subways, and the parks where they're a danger to themselves and everyone else. And that's what I've dedicated my life to stopping and helping uh, and naturally, if necessary, risking my life to do that as thousands of guardian angels have done since uh, 1979 when I started the group as the ninth manager of Mickey D's McDonald's in the Bronx. Well, that, you know, totally makes sense to me that those experiences and the experience uh, molded you and strengthened and empowered what was already inside of you. I can see that that's, that's who you were. So what I was going to ask you is, uh, how did you go about, because I'm just curious, I don't know if it's ever been told, how did you decide to choose the Red Beret and to get the name Guardian Angels? How did that happen to be? Well, back in the uh, late 70s in New York City, crime was everywhere, but especially in the subways, and the subways were dark and dank. And I recognized that in this group that I was starting to experiment with, create, form, I needed something very identifiable that you could see at great distance, uh, even in the shadows of the subway system. And I looked and I said, well, look, the Boy Scouts, they have red berets with a patch on it. They could be bought in uh, uh, dry goods stores, in military supply stores, in large amounts, in different sizes. And it gives a paramilitary look to you, unlike a baseball cap, which a lot of gangs would wear at the time. And so, in this look of the Red Beret, people understood, wow, these are serious young men and women out there. And as soon as people saw the Red Beret, they knew that we would be running towards them if they were in need, or if they needed help, they could run towards us. 
it's sort of like a, a shining light. It would give them an opportunity to maybe escape harm. And it served us well for 42 years. Internationally, we have 130 chapters in 13 countries. Everybody wears the same uniform. Everybody is trained the same. They're all local people with local leaders. But the Red Beret is synonymous with the Guardian Angels. So much so that Gucci actually put out a, uh, a premium uh, Red Beret with their little Gucci symbol on it and called it the Guardian Angel Beret because it's so synonymous now with what we do all over the world. Well, you know what? Very well done and congratulations. You know, in a world where too many times things come out that are really not okay and corruption and you find out about conspiracy, it's nice that you establish something really with no investment, just to help, pure help. So what I was gonna ask you, with all those years uh, uh, of your group, what stands out in your mind? What incidents stand out that you could relate to the public about where you help someone or someone in your group help someone and that was very dangerous? Well, first off, uh, I've had thousands of young men and women, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, uh, end up joining the Guardian Angels and then segueing into other aspects of their life. First and foremost, without a doubt, We've helped a lot of young people who were in need, who were dysfunctional, who would not have been part of the solution, would have been part of the problem, or predators that we were able to encourage to become protectors. Not an easy thing to do. And especially in America, where both the bad people and the good people want guns, bigger guns, I created a concept that said we would patrol unarmed, or we would physically intervene, we would make citizens arrest, we would stop fights and disputes, and people said, you're crazy. That'll never work. You're going to get injured. Your members are going to get injured. Or you'll revert to the tactics of a gang and eventually start carrying your weapons uh, yourself for protection. And then you'll become a menace to society. None of that ever happened. Six guardian angels were shot and killed in the line of duty in the first 13 years. I was shot multiple times. Others were seriously injured. To this day, they continue to go to various forms of therapy. And we never once vacillated and changed our rules and regulations, which was a non-weapon control, which has earned us respect in the meanest, toughest places, not just New York City and America, but the world. Absolutely. Uh, question I have for you. Uh, how do you see, because you've been on the streets and you've been in the subways, you've been in the different neighborhoods. How do you see that drugs have been impacting the city and how do you feel that drugs are correlated with what's going on with homelessness and these other factors? Well, both here in New York City, which is uh, the mothership of the Guardian Angels, where I started the group, and in major American cities all over the country, through the heartland, uh, through the West Coast, you see thousands of men and women who are living in homeless conditions, some of them with families, some of them as single, able-bodied men and women. And almost in every case, the person either has a severe alcohol addiction, drug addiction, or they're in need of emotional and mental health care, or to be taking their medicines that they've been prescribed to deal with their, what are called their demons, that come out of nowhere and cause them to have psychotic disorders. So instead of dealing with all three of these issues, we decide, the civil libertarians out there, that it is their civil right to wallow in their own defecation in Europe, to battle, to be uh, in an uncontrolled state where they're a danger to themselves and everyone else. That's not a civil right. And these are mostly progressives who say, oh no, we defend their right to be out in the streets, to live in the subways and the parks. Progress, progressive, you're progressively destroying them and you're progressively destroying, in this case, the city that we love. That's not humanitarian, that's not helpful. That's self-destructive. In fact, that's selfish. And that's the argument that I make, not just by saying it, but that, that opportunity to bully pulpit, as you mentioned, talk radio 30 years, now that I'm running for mayor of New York. But as the leader of the Guardian Angels, it's do as I say and as I do. And you see, that's what I want to promote for men and women out there, is that they don't need a movement to make a difference. They don't need a series of role models. They could be that role model. They just have to make, make up their minds 
that in this short brief time that they're here on this earth, that they're here to make a difference for other people, not just for self. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You come into this world with nothing. You leave with nothing. We want you to take care of yourself and your family. If you enrich yourself, if you become wealthy, that's part of the American dream, rags to riches. But you can't forget those who, for whatever reason, have been forgotten or left aside. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly can see that. In fact, one of the things that I wanted to add and the way I run my own life is uh, as I was a Cuban immigrant and I came here at a very young age to get away from communism, you know, I, I really so appreciate that this country gave us a home, took us in, uh, we, we had freedom, we were able to pursue it, it took work, but you know what? I don't see anybody playing on the basketball team on the college or high school unless they work at it. I don't see anyone getting a business started unless they work at it. So I really never had a problem at it. And I, I totally agree with you. I think sometimes uh, the world has kind of taken uh, kind of a, a, a victim outlook. And it's almost like, you know, uh, what kind of victims can we keep creating? And I say to myself, well, if we didn't have anyone else helping us, and all we had was a bunch of people out there who were expecting somebody else to do something, there would be no food, there'd be no supermarket, there would be no trucker, there would be no airline pilot, and we would never coordinate. So I, I totally can see what you're saying. So the next question I had for you, because I know you're running for mayor, so what do you feel needs to be corrected in New York City to keep it the greatest city on earth? Well, number one, we're never going to return to where we were before the lockdown and the pandemic. I'm the only candidate for mayor who has said, hey, guess what? Uh, we learned a lot of things during the pandemic. You didn't need to be in an office building doing your work. Actually, for a lot of people, it was a lot better. They were at home. They spent more time with their family, their kids. They weren't stuck like sardines traveling to and from work two hours a day. Their mental health was a lot better. I say, bravo, if more people want to work at home and it's better for their quality of life, I want to encourage that, even though it's detrimental to the recovery of the city. So we have to repurpose. We have to figure it out. Also, we saw that as big as e-commerce was before the lockdown and the pandemic, now you walk into an apartment building, you got to get through mountains of packages that have been delivered that same day from families in those buildings that ordered that product the same day it got delivered the same day. It's just a new way of doing business. So we got to help a lot of the small mom and pop shops to get back on track. But most importantly, none of this can be accomplished unless we deal with crime. Crime, crime, crime is the big issue in New York City. If we don't get control of our streets, our subways and our parks, if we don't make them safe again, like they were for 20 years, when Rudy Giuliani was mayor for eight, Michael Bloomberg for 12, well, then we're going to continue to descend. People are going to continue their exodus out of New York City. And people are going to be afraid to come to the theaters, the cultural establishments, spend 24 hours in the city that never used to sleep, or invest in the city or stay in the city. My, my whole goal, as you can see from my campaign side, improve, don't move. And I know whenever I talk to an audience, I tell them you're cheating on us. At night, you're on the computer. Boca Raton or Fort Myers is talking to you. Savannah, Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, Tennessee. You're halfway out the door. I don't want you to leave. I want you to fight for what you know is right because there are forces here that want us out. Led by AOC, All Out Crazy, the Democratic Socialists of America, the Justice Warriors, who basically want to destroy this city want to destroy it with a mighty Cyrus wrecking ball and install socialism and destroy the epicenter of capitalism for the world, New York City. And guess what? They're starting to make progress in that direction because too many of us are fleeing. Now, if you have to leave and you have no other choice, God bless you. But in honor of your parents and grandparents, many of whom birthed you here in New York City, you got to fight for what you know is right. We cannot fold like cheap cameras. That's not the way I was raised. I was raised, nobody chases us. Nobody scares us. We're Americans. 
the land of the free, the home of the brave. And hey, one yard, as my grandfather Fidel Bianchino would tell me about age, one yard, you got to start showing that you're brave. Don't be weak. And that really stuck with me my entire life. Well, you know what? You, you, you said something that really hits home with, with me and probably a lot of viewers out there because, you know, our grandparents, our parents, I know my own grandfather was a great motivation to me and uh, always asking me and at, telling me, like, well, what have you done? And, uh, you know, my own father, who uh, helped a lot of people, he was actually a, a physician, a Cuban physician, had to restart, but he did that. And he always told me, he said, look, if you just work at things, things will happen. And uh, I think you're right. I think that somehow we've got to take a look at what is wealth? Is wealth just money? I don't think so. Wealth is having a community that's safe. Wealth is having an ability to have your doors without alarms and security and, and police. What is wealth? Wealth is actually taking good care of NYPD so they feel comfortable because they're the ones protecting us. So that it can be like when I was a little kid back in Connecticut. I didn't grow up in New York. I grew up in Manchester, Connecticut. But you know, the police were somebody that you respected and they took care of you. Uh, they actually didn't harass you. And they were almost like uh, relatives of your parents trying to get you to be disciplined. So, you know, I totally agree with you. What I wanted to ask you is what goals do you think are important that you'd like to achieve in the rest of your lifetime? Well, when I eventually passed into the hereafter, and I'd like to live to 110 because my father, Chester, he wanted to live to 110. And I remember the last days he was alive, the administrator of the hospital that he was in, Maimonides, said, hey, by the way, Chester, how old are you? And he said 110 when he was only 92. <laughs> and that was a signal to me that he was cashing out. So in honor of my father, with all the problems that I've had, shot five times with hollow point bullets, I've had stage four prostate cancer, ileitis, colitis, chronic Crohn's disease. I've been married more times than I've had radio partners in my 30 year career. With all that said, I wanna to live to 110 because I value every moment of the day. I cherish it because I shouldn't be here. So I know I got a purpose here in this planet and that's to make sure that I engage in selfless service. As my mother, Francesca, was like a saint with my aunts. Ah, my uncles, uh, phenomenal to them. But my aunts, they would go to novenas on Monday, they do stations of the cross, they do the rosaries, they had the saints, the candles. You couldn't curse in front of them, they hit you so hard, your head would spin around like Linda Blair, <laughs> the exorcist, and they would say, Curtis, poverty brings you closer to God. I said, poverty brings you closer. Oh, yeah. Selfless service, poverty. I'm at the point in my life, I'm 67. By the time I get buried, it'll probably be in Potter's Field in a cardboard box. But I'm telling you this. I want an RIP. He died. He tried. I gave every ounce of every moment of my life to trying to make things better, not just for myself and my family, but for everyone. I can see that because I... You know, there's so many things in your bio I haven't even touched upon on the show uh, just because of the lack of time. But uh, absolutely, you know, I wholeheartedly think that uh, one of the things that I would like to see our viewers do is just invest some time in your community. Take a look at what you want to do, whether it's in your church, your synagogue, your mosque, you want to do sporting events, you want to do dance classes, uh, you know, you want to teach people history, art. Uh, and if we do that, you know, I, I wanted to relay something. When I fly into New York and I look down and I see the size of New York, one thing that I always marvel about is I say, there's a guy down there decided to be a baker. Some guy decided to be a police. There's a woman there who decided that she wanted to be a teacher in a Canarsie High School. And there's another woman who decided to open up an Italian restaurant. And I said, somehow, all these people are coordinated. And I think your message is very nice where you say, you know, we, we take care of our family. We don't run away from our house. We look at New York City as our house. So what I wanted to ask you, because we're getting near the end of the show, but I, I know you have a lot of feelings and, 
in your heart, what would you like to communicate to the viewers watching this show that you would like them to implement in their lives? And also, I want you to share, what is it, I mean, I see that your family was a big influence, but when it gets tough for you, what is it that you, what keeps you going? Because you, you definitely do a tremendous amount. Go ahead, please. Well, number one, uh, do not treat our political system as if it's totally corrupt and you shouldn't have involvement in it. I mean, you should cherish our political system that gives you choice. It's a democracy, one of the few places where we can condemn our leaders, make fun of them in the worst way, and don't end up with a bullet in the back of your head or being sent to the gulag. We need to cherish that, get more people involved politically, teach civics in schools so that we get more people involved in our political system. But with that said, trust people not politicians hold their feet and their hands to the fire and that includes myself the moment i kissed my first baby shook my first hand running for mayor that made me a politician and most importantly never befriend the politician they are supposed to serve you and if they're not serving you in their best in their best effort but then they have to be held accountable because nobody asks them to run for office. They raise millions of dollars and they act like they're the Mashiach, the savior. And guess what? I trust people. I don't trust politicians. And I'm hoping they learn about politics, the importance of it, that they trust people more than they do politics. Makes total sense. You, you know, the, the value of a human being, if we look at it, is immeasurable because if uh, in my own uh, practice as a surgeon if I didn't have my staff it doesn't matter how competent I am I couldn't function and uh, you know I know that if I didn't have my wife you know my home would not be the same and uh, in fact you know she's visiting <coughs> some friends and I really have realized the you know how much that human warmth and that care and compassion. So I want to end the show by telling you, I really want to validate you for what you've done your whole lifetime. Oh yeah, now uh, if I can, I can, I want to tell you about a mission that I have. It's not unfortunately, just unfortunately, I unfortunately we run out of time. Oh, okay, but okay. we will continue on another show. Thank you for being on the show. And uh, to the view, uh, it was a great honor and continue i wish you very well and to our viewers out there we can take uh, an example of mr sliwa help your community care about your city care about your community and from a time for truth have a very good day and we'll see you for the next episode my pleasure sometimes life can be so damn hard you don't know where Go. Everything keeps falling apart. Yeah. You try to do your best, but only God knows that you've given everything you've got, but the world takes you down. You just keep moving on. At your feet